Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today, in our 304th episode, we have a bunch of news, including two sauropod stories with a new genus as well as some tooth marks. Ooh. Yeah, just for you. Nice. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Ichthyovenator, and of course, a pretty good fun fact. I think this week it has to do with dragons and how they're related to dinosaurs, or at least the legends of dragons. <laughs> But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, those patrons are Christine, Ray, Leah, Blue Gollumer, Kessler, Tarkia Tamer, James Pasco, Risa, Trev, and Mayu. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate all your support and we enjoy chatting with y'all in Discord. I suspect that's where Garrett's fun fact came from this week. It was inspired by a Discord conversation for sure. So if you want to join in on the conversation, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. So jumping into the news up first, we have the new sauropod that I mentioned a moment ago. It's a mementious sword from China, and it was published in Historical Biology by Xin Xin Ren and others. And in it, they describe a mementious sword, as I said. Nice. Those are the ones with the really long necks. Yeah, ridiculously long. <laughs> this one's named Analong Chuanjiensis, although I'll probably say Analong because I'm from Wisconsin and sometimes we make the A's a little bit that way. So Analong <laughs> is named after the village where it was found, plus Long for Dragon. I was surprised that Ana was the full name of a village, but I couldn't find it on the map. So I couldn't see what the actual name was and they just said it's named after the village. So I assume that's the full village name. And then Chuangjiensis is after a nearby city, Chuangjie. So this is just another Chinese city name long, city name ensis sort of <laughs> dinosaur, which are pretty common. Previously, this one was assigned to Chuangjiensis anaensis, and basically they just switched the genus and species names. So anaensis became analong, and Chuangjiensis became Chuang Jansis, so they just flipped it. They must not have a lot of really ambitious namers over in Asia because they're happy to just name it after the place and not after a person or after an institution or anything. Yeah, well, maybe in this case it's easier to keep track of the history of its naming too if you just flip it. It does make it really easy to know where dinosaurs come from. Like one of the most common dinosaurs is Lufungosaurus, and it's from Lufung, so that makes it really easy to know where it's from. Analong is from the Chuangjie Formation, so it's also the name of the city and the formation. That happens a lot. It's in the Yunnan province in southwest China, and this formation is from the Middle Jurassic. Both Chuangjie Saurus and what is now Analong were described in 2000 from Lufeng World Dinosaur Valley. So I looked that up because that doesn't sound like the name of a formation, and it turns out it's the name of a dinosaur museum and theme park. Well, that sounds fun. It's really hard to tell what it's like online, but I am very intrigued. So if anybody knows about it, let us know, because I really want to know what this place is like. Maybe it's like the Great Valley. It looked kind of like a cross between like a log ride and Dinosaur National Monument. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell how many dinosaurs they have on display, but these two, Analong and Chuanjiensis, are still in situ in the park. And they, they teach people about it, just like the rock wall at Dinosaur National Monument. Mm. So they described it without actually fully excavating it because they want to leave it in situ as like a teaching tool. So maybe it's like Ocean Park in Hong Kong. Kind of. So that's a zoo, not paleontological. Right. But you've got this mix of educational and theme park rides. That's true. Yeah. Because it's still in situ at the Lufeng World Dinosaur Valley, they can't see all of the bones that might be there. Because obviously they don't want to dig back into the rock because they want to leave the exposed bones exposed and don't want to dig them out to see if there's anything behind them. So they basically have the left side of the animal hmm. and there might be a right side underneath, but they don't know. In total, they found two thirds of the neck, which is pretty good considering with a mementosaurid, that's almost half the length <laughs> of the animal. They also found most of the tail and back vertebrae, some hips, femur, a full front leg and part of the front foot. Unfortunately, there is no skull, which, oh. yeah, that happens a lot with sauropods. 
Another fortunate detail is that these analog bones have a pretty good overlap with the Chuangjie saurus, including the front leg, femur, and about a dozen of the tail vertebrae. We know from both, so it makes it a lot easier to compare and see are these bones similar enough to be in the same genus and or species, or are they different enough that we should give them a different name and treat them as a different animal. They found differences in the tail vertebrae and ulna between analong and chuanjie saurus, and they also called out some other unique traits in analong, but they don't have overlapping bones in chuanjie saurus, including that it has an especially wide pubis or hip bone. Oh, so a big gut? Maybe. Yeah, I suppose. But the pubis is like, it's not the widest part of the hips. So I don't know if the other part of the hips is wider than usual, or if it's just this, it's kind of like the inner part is wider. But I'm not really sure if that should count as a unique feature of Analong, because we haven't found it in Chuanjie Saurus. So it's possible that it also had some of these same traits that we are considering unique right now, but might not end up being in the long term. Phylogenetically, Analong is a basal mementosaurid, meaning that it's earlier in the evolution of mementosaurids than later dinosaurs like Mementosaurus. And that's important in this case because Chuanjie Saurus came out as a sort of sister taxa to Mementosaurus. So Chuanjie Saurus seems to be fairly far away in the family tree of Mementosaurids from Analong. Hmm. Not really sure if this one's going to hold up because a lot of times these split genera are contested later. You have to wait for somebody to do a sort of unbiased review paper where they look at all the different sauropods like Emmanuel Schopp did when he brought back Brontosaurus. We'll have another version of that at some point, and I'm sure they'll look at Chuanjesaurus and Analong and decide whether or not they think they're different. It seemed like some of the differences were pretty big, like there was a thing on the ulna where two of the bumps on the end of the bone on one of them were 45 degrees apart and on the other one were 60 degrees apart which is a pretty significant difference and i I assume it would have implications for how muscles attached and maybe the posture of the leg and things like that so as long as that wasn't just individual variation which i don't know how much it varies between individuals someone would have to look at a whole bunch of sauropods and see how much individual variation there is then i think it'll probably hold up Up next is our other sauropod paper. This one was published in the Science of Nature, which is open access. I haven't seen that journal before, but I love a new open access journal when I discover it. Not sure if it's actually new, but (laughs) new to me. It was written by Felix Augustin and others, and they described a sauropod bone that appears to have mammal tooth marks on it. Oh no! Was it a juvenile sauropod that a mammal was able to get to it? They didn't mention that specifically, but they do think it was probably already dead by the time the mammal was chewing on it. Oh, okay. So that's a good opportunistic mammal. Yes. The bone in question is a cervical rib, which are the long, thin neck bones that usually run parallel to the neck and vertebral column. Although, while I was looking into cervical ribs, I found out that some of the sauropods have sort of cervical rib loops and all sorts of weird other stuff going on. In mementosaurids, they're very long and they overlap up to three or four other vertebrae. So they Hmm. stretch out really far. And they think that's because it had such a long neck that it helps sort of distribute the stress. Or maybe they could have their muscles closer to their shoulders and then use these ribs in their neck to sort of attach to long tendons from the muscles. So they didn't need that heavy muscle in the neck. And then they could grow the neck longer. It's a really interesting trait that dinosaurs have. And a lot of other animals have, but not mammals. Although apparently one in 500 people, meaning humans <laughs> today, have one or two cervical ribs in their neck. And it has the result of making your two vertebrae feel like they're fused together. So it reduces flexibility and it, it's not, not a good thing to have in does our it, case. Does it make your neck look longer? No, because it, it's like it doesn't it's not an extra vertebrae. It just is next to the vertebrae. Hmm. And then it just kind of blocks their movement a little bit. But some people have it. It's kind of cool. If you have them, you're kind of like a sauropod. You can think of it that way. (laughs) (laughs) They think that this cervical rib is from a mementosaurid, just like our previous discovery that we talked about. This one's also from China. And if you ever get the chance to go to the Kitak Yushu Museum in Japan, it's a little bit out of the way. It's not near Tokyo or anything. It's down on the southern island. But they have a really cool mementosaurid 
in their animatronic room and it's like 90 percent neck that you can see of it it's and really it cool. moves yeah it's really impressive it's a really cool display i always think of that when i think of mementos swords well it's also part of a show there yeah yeah it's like you go into this room and it talks you through the extinction of dinosaurs kind of and like how this fauna formed because japan was attached to china back in the cretaceous so they had the same kind of dinosaurs they had mementosaurids in japan as well so not surprising that they had a dinosaur similar to this one maybe that's what lufeng dinosaur valley is like could be because it felt almost like a ride except you're standing yeah they might have some of that stuff in there the only pictures i saw of something that looked like a ride are one of those where you sit on one of those round rafts and then you bounce around so sort of like a log ride but it's like the round rapids Mm. sort of experience i don't know if they had other rides or if it's just that one because they had a lake and they're like let's do something with this lake but (laughs) it looks like an interesting place But back to this new story. So they estimate the Mementosaur that had this cervical rib was probably at least 20 meters or about 65 feet long. So pretty long. It would have had quite a neck on it too. You're talking 20, 30 feet probably at the minimum. This one's in a different area of China than our previous discovery. This one's in the Jungar Basin in the Xinjiang province in northwestern China. And it's from the late Jurassic. So it's a little bit later than the previous find. And It appears, like we were saying, that the cervical rib has traces from a mammal scraping meat off of the bone of the cervical rib. They think that it was unintentionally scratching the bone. They don't think it was like a hyena that was digesting the bone and chewing on it intentionally. But instead, it has what they call a gnawed appearance, sort of like it was gnawing parallel to the bone, trying to get every last little scrap of meat off. Hmm. And... They think that that's what's happening because there are small scratches in parallel pairs going along certain spots. So it didn't want any meat to go to waste. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there might not have been much left by the time this mammal got there. Or maybe it was like hiding in the neck Mm. trying to get it. Well, you know, sneakily. (laughs) I'm not sure. But it had really, really small scratches. You wouldn't notice these unless you used a magnifying glass or maybe a microscope because they were 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters long and 0.25 millimeters wide at the widest. Hmm. Some of them were only 30 microns wide. Wow. So we're talking about really tiny scratches on this bone. They also only found these types of scratches on bumps in the bone, not on the flat areas or where it was indented. And presumably that's because the mammal was sort of chewing meat off and didn't know exactly where the bone was. And then when it got to a bump, it would just accidentally hit it because it's chewing at a similar depth. But then when the bone sticks up, it it runs into it. None of the scratches penetrated the outer layers of the bone either. So another sign that it wasn't trying to chew on the bone. To Sabrina's earlier point, the authors say, quote, Due to the extreme size discrepancy of the predator and prey, the bite marks clearly represent scavenging behavior, end quote. Because, yeah, maybe if it was a juvenile, there could have been a mammal that would eat it. But in this case, it's such a small mammal that I think even a newly hatched sauropod would probably be too big of a (laughs) animal to try to fight against, especially if it had that crazy horn sticking out of its lip, like the one we talked about the other day. Oh, the egg tooth? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it wasn't necessarily an egg tooth. They thought it might have had it after hatching, too. Right, right. One of the possible mammals that it could have been is called Sinolutherus, I think is how you say it. I'm not really super familiar with pronouncing mammal names. But they estimate the adult size of Sinolutherus to be less than 100 grams or under a quarter pound. So this is like... Tiny. Yeah, maybe like a rat sized is my best guess. Maybe even smaller, like a mouse That makes sense. Mammals were very small when dinosaurs were in their heyday. Yeah, there were some bigger ones that were like tens of pounds. But yeah, this is definitely on the smaller scale. (laughs) There were also a few other mammals that were are known from the area. But this is the only one that we have teeth from. So that they're obviously what they needed to use in order to compare to the gnaw marks. And they seem to match up pretty well. The authors also say, quote, the traces represent the oldest direct evidence for mammalian feeding behavior in the fossil record, end Mm. quote. So that's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. It's been expected for a while that we would find scavenging earlier, basically as early as some of the earliest mammals in the Triassic, because a lot of mammals are heterodont, and that means that they have different teeth in the mouth. They're not all just like T-Rex, where they have all 
big serrated teeth. Mammals have, we have like in your mouth, you know, you got incisors and bicuspids and molars and all sorts of stuff like that. And the reason we have those teeth is because different teeth are useful for eating different kinds of food. So we assumed that these mammals that also had heterodont teeth back in the Triassic and Jurassic and Cretaceous were probably omnivores eating different things, being a little bit opportunistic. So even though these are the oldest traces of this type for now, I don't think it's going to last that long because the heterodont mammals were also there in the mid and early Jurassic and even Triassic. So sooner or later, someone's going to look at a bone under a magnifying glass and pick up one of these little scratches that people hadn't noticed before, and it'll push that timeline back farther. We were always there. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> just just like the mammals in the Triassic, the marks on the bones are <laughs> remaining inconspicuous. Mm-hmm. In the area, they also found some theropod teeth around the sauropod bones, including what they call a large carnosaur, as well as a quote-unquote smaller theropod that they couldn't identify. So it definitely wasn't just the mammals eating this, which should be obvious because I can't imagine. It'd have to be like a swarm of piranhas amount of <laughs> little mice to take down all the meat that you could eat off of one of these sauropods. And presumably something else killed it unless it died of natural causes and it maybe could have been this large carnosaur. I don't know. Fortunately for us, dinosaurs, unlike mammals, just shed teeth like no tomorrow. So even though they don't have bones from this carnosaur and theropod, they were dropping teeth all over the place while they were eating. So we know that they were there at one point, probably exposing this meat and bone that the mammals eventually ended up chewing on. Yeah, they got most of that neck meat. And then there was enough for the mammal to scrape off the bone. <laughs> yeah. And it might have been like a tendon or something, too, because it's near these bumps on the bone. It's maybe something that the larger predators weren't interested in or didn't want to spend the time trying to scrape off compared to meat. One of the interesting details about it is the traces of these teeth marks look similar to how living insectivore mammals chew on things like the the sort of marks they leave if they chew on something that they're scavenging hmm. so it's possible that this is an opportunistic situation where usually it was eating insects maybe other things and then stumbled upon this massive sauropod neck with some meat on it and why not jackpot yeah exactly it's like it'd be the equivalent of one of us running into i don't know i can't even imagine something that scale like several semi trucks full of food <laughs> probably. Well, we would barely make a dent. Exactly, yeah. Obviously, this sort of ability to eat dead dinosaurs and get every little scrap of meat off of them would have been especially useful in, say, a post-asteroid impact scenario where there are lots of dead dinosaurs and one needs to find new sources of food. I also think this study is really helpful in pointing out that nature isn't just a series of direct conflicts between healthy adults because a lot of times we think about mammals during the reign of dinosaurs and think like, well, how could they possibly survive then? Everything was so much bigger and stronger. And the answer is, well, they didn't fight them. <laughs> they hit underground. And then when one of them got killed by something else, they popped out, chewed a little bit of meat off of it and went back underground. Yeah. And then maybe they did some things for fun too, like that meme you recently posted of a cow cuddling with a hedgehog stuffed animal <laughs> that's true that doesn't really help with survival but i i do but, see your point yeah it's not all about fighting or not even all about eating it's true there's a strong words coming from you well for me it's mostly about eating <laughs> it's eating and doing this podcast there you go <laughs> eating and dinosaurs and since we've done two solar pot papers i got a sneak and ankylosaur paper in here this one was written by Victoria Arbor, obviously, and others, and published in Fossil Record, which is the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin's open access journal. So another open access one that I hadn't seen before. It's an update on Victoria Arbor's work in British Columbia. Well, did you, you did two sauropod stories, so you thought, well, I better do an ankylosaur story to yes. make up for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had to find a, a good ankylosaur story. Got it. This one may not be as earth shattering as the earliest ever mammal traces on a cervical rib or a new genus, but it's still an ankylosaur, so I like it. Specifically, this paper is talking about some more ankylosaur remains that were found in collections. They were actually collected in the 1930s in northeastern British Columbia, so an area that isn't known for a lot of dinosaur fossils, but Victoria Arbor is scouring Canada trying to find these new. I didn't realize that they had some over in Ontario because these are actually 
listed as CMN 59667, which stands for the Canadian Museum of Nature, and that's in Ottawa. And then they took them over to the ROM to prep them. So they're all the way over (laughs) in Ontario, but they're from British Columbia, which I think is why Victoria Arbor was working on them because she's working in British Columbia now. Also, she is the ankylosaur person, especially if you're in Canada. So makes perfect sense. In this find, it's one single block with two ankylosaur back vertebrae and two quote unquote probable ankylosaur ribs. Although there is a little bit of an asterisk here because the vertebrae are incomplete enough that it is possible it's just one vertebra in two pieces and they got shifted around a little bit because they're not articulated. They're in a block that's kind of jumbled up a little bit. So it could be one that got broken and then fossilized in a weird sort of orientation. But most likely it's two different vertebrae, different pieces. Unfortunately, there's not enough detail to know the species or even to know if it had a tail club making it an ankylosaurid, or if it didn't have a tail club, making it a notosaurid. But the footprints from the area where this fossil was found have been identified as a notosaur. I didn't know that you could tell the difference between a notosaur and an ankylosaur from a footprint, that their feet were different enough to make that distinction. It's pretty cool. But I guess that means that if you had to guess, you'd say this is probably a notosaur. If we have notosaur footprints and then you find this block, But the fossilized block is from the early to mid Cenomanian, which makes it about 95 million years ago in what would be called the earliest of the late Cretaceous (laughs) or the mid Cretaceous, if you prefer. And by that point, Ankylosauridae was well established. So there were both notosaurids and ankylosaurids. So we can't say for sure if it was a tail clubber or a tail swisher. (laughs) The official terms. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I'm going with. Hopefully they're able to find more of this individual later. They did go up there. We talked about it last year. They went back up there and looked at the site or what they think is the site for more bones from this individual. But the river was kind of high and they didn't have a lot of time. So they didn't manage to find anything new. But who knows? Maybe they'll be able to later or find a separate site that has a new ankylosaurid find or notosaurid. In other news, the University of Zurich Zoological and Paleontological Museum has recently reopened and they have a new exhibit. It's a Platyosaurus fossil that's alongside a life-size replica of Platyosaurus and that's based on the fossil specimen. So this fossil was excavated in Frick in 2018. It took them about two years to prepare and its right shoulder is a lot thicker than its left shoulder. And it shows bone growth where it healed after a bad injury. So that's why it's thicker. So Ben Pabst and Christian Klug said that they didn't think it could have survived if it was quadrupedal because of this bone growth, the pathology. So it would have been temporarily tripedal at best if it was normally quadrupedal. They're saying it's likely that Platyosaurus was bipedal. The fossil's hind legs are in a frog-like position, and that might mean it got stuck in the mud and died there. Oh, no. Which apparently happened to a lot of animals in the Frick region. Is Frick in Switzerland? Yes. I guess it makes sense. Platyosaurus is usually depicted as bipedal, but this is more evidence, I suppose, because they're saying you can't walk around. And presumably it healed fully, so it didn't die from that injury to its shoulder. And therefore, if it could walk and compete enough to not get taken down as an easy prey. Yeah, well, unless you're mud. (laughs) That's true. Most dinosaurs are easy prey for mud. (laughs) Next, there was an article in West Sussex County Times that wrote about how it was Mary Ann Mantell, Dr. Gideon Mantell's wife, who found dinosaur teeth by the road in Cuckfield, and that is what ended up being named Iguanodon. Wow. One of the three original dinosaurs of Dinosauria. That sounds like that was the holotype then, because the Iguanodon teeth were what it's named after. Yeah, but the credit has mostly gone to Gideon. He's the one who formally named it in 1825. This makes me wonder if any of the early dinosaur discoveries were made by men, because we just keep getting more and more (laughs) of these stories where it was like, no, it was actually Franz Nopsha's sister that found this, and now it's Gideon Mantell's wife that found this. Well, I wonder about that, because when we went to the Natural History Museum in London, she was featured prominently alongside him, but I can't remember now what it said exactly Hmm. about how Iguanodon was discovered. But in this article, anyway, they talk about one man, Martin Simpson, came across an 1887 article in the Mid-Sussex Times that details how Mary found the fossils, 
while walking along a roadside with a friend, and they passed a man who was breaking up lumps of stones. So she found the fossils, and then she gave that man money so that she could take the fossils to her friend's house, and then eventually they took it home to Gideon to look at. And by eventually, it was actually probably the next day. They said it happened May 21st, 1821, and then he got the fossils the next day. So then Gideon went to the pit and then paid the men working on the area to preserve any fossils that they found. And Simpson said the importance of the story is to make sure that Mary gets credit for finding the fossils. But again, I feel like I've heard that story before, so maybe there's multiple stories out there. Anyway, apparently Mary and Gideon separated at some point, and Gideon was very bitter about it until his death. And he even told his son Walter to get rid of any journal entries that mentioned Mary. Oh, boy. So there's evidence she contributed a lot to his work over the years. But then it got erased when he had control of the history. Mm -hmm. So there have been different versions of the Iguanodon discovery stories where Gideon found the fossils or the fossils were found by quarrymen, but now the details are in place. It was Mary. Yeah. It's good to have a primary source from the 1800s that talks about that. Mm -hmm. And granted, it's an 1887 article about something that happened in 1821, <laughs> but that's a lot closer than if we're writing about it now. Well, some of the people that were around in 1821 were probably still alive and able to talk about it in 1887. Yeah, they're definitely closer to the sources. <laughs> Uh, just real quick, if you're looking for more dinosaur material in general, especially written ones, National Geographic released their Reimagining Dinosaurs issue. I haven't seen the printed version. I've seen photos of it. It looks really pretty. There's also a whole bunch of articles online, lots of articles spotlighting specific exciting finds from the past few years, like Boreal, Pelta, and Zool. And there's videos and activities for kids, too, such as dinosaur quizzes and games. I saw some pictures of Spinosaurus. That's the real, if you had to say like a dinosaur that's been reimagined big time. Oh, yeah. Recently, it's definitely Spinosaurus. Yeah, they cover a lot. Oh, I also recently learned that September is Velociraptor Awareness Month. What? Just real quick, though. That reminds me of that stop, drop, and roll illustration for what to do if you're covered in raptors. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was Tenontosaurus because they're always depicted being eaten yeah. by Deinonychus. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, to celebrate Universal... Orlando Resort's Jurassic Park-themed island has a raptor encounter, and you can learn more about Velociraptor there. So Jurassic Park trainers share facts about raptors, and then visitors can interact with one, including blue or baby raptors Tango and Sierra. And they said they specifically have the baby raptors in case you're with children who are too afraid of blue. Yeah, that happens. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are scary. Yeah, but also cool. Speaking of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, so Screen Rant's got a couple of ideas of how Jurassic World Dominion could end based on the books and the previous trilogy and movies. So a few options here. I don't know if this counts as spoilers because we really don't know at this point. <laughs> but option one, all the dinosaurs get rounded up, assuming there aren't too many out there, and then they go back to Isla Nubar or an island. that This is unlikely because Isla Nubar was destroyed by a volcano. They're also saying, well, governments would be more likely to wipe out the dinosaurs with their military. But if they go that route where the governments wipe out the dinosaurs with their military, that kind of goes against the whole premise of Jurassic Park because they're making the dinosaurs go extinct again. Yeah, I could see that being like the end of Michael Crichton's idea because in a lot of his books, it's like there's this terrible invention by humans and then it's like, how do you wrap it up? Mm. You got to undo what you did and learn from your mistake. But yeah. Yeah. This is a money-making machine, so they're not going to wipe out all the dinosaurs. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so option two is Ian Malcolm is right, and now humans coexist with non-avian dinosaurs. And this <laughs> would mean that a military response doesn't work, and dinosaurs procreate quickly enough that there's too many to contain them all. And then maybe there's a jump 10 years into the future that shows how the coexistence is working out. I find both of these scenarios incredibly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> But that one's fun. It's like the equivalent of like the bunnies in Australia mm -hmm. just taking out. We just have endemic dinosaurs like everywhere, like invading the ecosystem and screwing everything up. Yep. <laughs> That's kind of how Battle of Big Rock seemed. Yeah, it's true. Well, anyway, we'll just have to wait. It's less than a year now, actually. Yeah. Next summer. Yeah. I'm excited. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Ichthyo Venador, which was a request from thieving raptor Lorenzo via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. 
Ichthyovenador was a spinosaurid that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Laos. That is a fantastic name for a spinosaurid, like a, a fish snatcher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the genus name means fish hunter. <laughs> so the holotype's estimated to be 28 to 34 feet, 8.5 to 10.5 meters long, and weigh 2.4 tons. And Ichthyovenador had straight conical teeth, not serrated, and a reduced pelvic girdle. And its neck was similar to Sigilmosaurus, now Spinosaurus. It had tall neural spines on its back that made a sail, and it had a sail on its back and hips. This sail had a wavy or sinusoidal shape where it curved downwards and then split into two separate sails. And it looks kind of like a piece of the sail is missing. Yeah, just like Spinosaurus, I suppose. It's a little different from Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus had the very large sail. I don't think Ichthyovenator's sail was quite as large. And the way it splits, too, it's literally like, two pieces of a sail there's like a dip in the middle almost is it flat on the front or is it like a curved like curving up it looks like it's curving up and then there's like a almost v-shaped dip well it depends on the paleo art you look at interesting i think i've seen people depict this and then conca venator which has that just triangle shaped bump on its back and like putting them together like puzzle pieces yeah <laughs> <laughs> like back to back that's funny <laughs> So this sail may have been for display or species recognition or thermoregulation or for storing energy, all the same ideas we have for all spinosaurids. Ichthyovenador was probably semi-aquatic. Its tail spines were tall, that may have helped it swim, and it may have used its tail to help propel it through water. The paleo are, like I said, it looks really similar to spinosaurus, especially the tail part, though the sail on the back, again, it's not as tall as spinosaurus is. Ichthyovenador fossils were found in 2010. They found a partial skeleton, no skull, no limbs. But because it's a spinosaur, it probably had an elongated snout and probably ate fish. It's usually a safe bet when you've got unserrated, pointy, spear-like teeth. Mm -hmm. As a spinosaur, it also likely had strong arms and large thumb claws. It was described in 2012 by Ronan Alain and others. The type and only species is Ichthyovenador lausensis. And again, the genus name means fish hunter, and the species name refers to Laos, where it was found. More fossils were found in 2014, including teeth, vertebrae, and a pubic bone. It was reported to be the first definite spinosaur from Asia, but Siamosaurus had been named in 1986. However, that was known mostly from tooth fossils, and there may be two partial skeletons, but it's not yet certain if they are Siamosaurus. So a bit of confusion there. Originally, Ichthyovenador was thought to be part of the subfamily Baryonicinae but it's now thought to be a primitive Spinosaurinae, and that's because of its non-serrated teeth and its vertebrae being similar to Sigilmosaurus or Spinosaurus. Other animals that lived around the same time and place as Ichthyovenador included sauropods, such as Tongveasaurus, ornithopods, bivalves, mollusks, fish, and turtles. And our fun fact of the day is that the first reconstruction of a fossilized animal might be a dragon statue in Austria. Well, that is fun. I think so. It predates the Crystal Palace dinosaurs by almost 300 years. What does it look like? So <laughs> it's pretty much what you'd expect if you think of like a medieval dragon, European dragon sculpture. Right now I can only think of a Chinese style the where it's long. Well, it is. So interestingly, I didn't realize this, but it's not as simple as like Asian dinosaurs are long and skinny and... European dragons are like the Welsh, like big winged monster Game of Thrones style. Mm -hmm. This one's like kind of halfway in between the two. Oh, well, I suppose if you think of the Welsh flag, that one's also pretty lanky. Yeah, a lot of them are sort of serpentine. And then over time, they became less snake-like and more like griffin or something like. Mm. So this statue slash fountain is usually called the Cloggenfort Lindworm. And lindworms are long snake-like dragons. They're usually wingless, so they're actually a lot like those Chinese dragons. They're sort of just like giant snakes with arms <laughs> and usually just two feet. So like an interesting halfway in between what you think about with like a Welsh dragon and a Chinese dragon. And I guess geographically, Austria is kind of in between as well. Maybe yeah. that's related. Klagenfort is a small city near the border with Slovenia and also a little bit eastern, northeastern Italy. And it's sort of a less inhabited area. It's a pretty dense forest. There's also a lot of like floodplain going on there. And Klagenfort 
literally translates to Ford of Lament. And one etymology for Klagenfort is that the nearby waters were thought to be inhabited by demons or a dragon, or otherwise the floods were just really dangerous. So people didn't want to go into that area because you could get killed by the water itself. The city legend is that the city was founded after a pair of heroes and their bull defeated the Lindworm that controlled the area. The stories are so fun because basically they said that they built a stone tower or the king had built a stone tower to keep the Lindworm at bay and sort of like prevent it from leaving its like swampy foresty area and coming after the the people of (laughs) nearby cities. And these... Depending on which version you read, I read three completely different versions. One of them was they used a big bull as bait, and then the Linverm came out and they killed it. Another version is that they took the bull and they put like spikes on it. So when the Linverm bit into it, the spikes killed the dragon. Hmm. And then the last version was that they just had a bull with them, but they went out and killed it without the bull at all. So somewhere between (laughs) the bull doing all the work and none of the work, (laughs) but there are always two people. And sometimes the people are just like volunteers that are responding to a reward. Sometimes they're farmers that are tired of people getting killed. There's like so many different versions because the story is at least a thousand years old. So as a result, the city's crest is a dragon flying in front of a single stone tower representing, you know, that tower that these heroes potentially either tied a bull to or just went past on their way to killing the dragon. And the dragon has changed quite a bit over the centuries in its depiction. Originally, it was really long. It had two legs and wings and then like its tail is all curled up so that it even fits on this crest. But the depictions added two extra legs in the 16th century, roughly from what I can tell. And they took away the wings? It still has wings, but the wings didn't really get any bigger, And but they made the body bulkier. So now it looks like it's got these two little tiny wings on like a big old dragon body. Oh. And it still has a long tail that's kind of curled up behind it. Okay. So it's not usually wingless. Linferms in general are usually wingless because they're not just from Klagenfort. Oh, okay. But in Klagenfort, for some reason, they always depict it as having wings. I'm not sure why. Some people that are big into dragons say that it's really more of a wyvern than it is a lindworm. Hmm. So on to the reconstruction, because that's, I guess, what the fun fact really is. So in the 1300s, a woolly rhinoceros skull was found near Klagenfort and attributed to a lindworm. Although exactly where it is and when it was found is also hard to nail down. There is an area that's known as like the dragon's coffin or something like that where they think the woolly rhinoceros was found and then in 1590 the Klagenfort Linverm or Klagenfort Drake was built as a fountain in the center of town so it got commissioned and built in 1590 so compared to the crystal palace dinosaurs which were made i think in the 1850s 1840s 1850s this is there you go like 250 years earlier Reportedly, they used that woolly rhino skull as a model for its head, thinking that it was, in fact, the dragon. But to me, it doesn't really look anything like a rhino. (laughs) They only have basically the upper part of the skull. They don't have the jaw. And the only part of the sculpture that really looks to me at all like a rhino is its ears. And the ears aren't preserved. So it's kind of funny that it has sort of rhino looking ears, at least to me. The sculpture has four legs, two small wings, and a long curled tail. So it's kind of the more recent depiction of what the Klagenfort Linverm looks like. Reportedly, it weighs somewhere between six and nine tons. And I couldn't figure out what it was made out of because there was one place on the Atlas Obscura which claimed it was a solid piece of slate, but I couldn't find anybody else carving sculptures out of slate. It seems like a weird thing to make a sculpture out of. So I'm a little bit skeptical about that. But whatever it's made out of, it's something durable because it's over 400 years old and it's holding up pretty well. I mentioned that it's a fountain and basically it's got its mouth open. It almost looks like it's yawning and there's just water kind of pouring out of the bottom of its mouth into a birdbath looking pedestal. (laughs) It's kind of a weird fountain. It doesn't look all that ferocious. They're just showing how they won because it used to live in the water. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it's a fountain because it's a water monster. Yeah, that's a good point. For some reason, they added a separate Hercules sculpture in front of it, and he's holding a huge spike club behind his back. 
I don't know why, because I'm pretty sure on the Linferm, they describe the the story of who killed it being like the two farmers or two people and their cow. So why Hercules is right in front of it, clearly about to hit it with a club. I don't know. Hercules is making sure it's not coming back. Yeah, sure. It's so weird. One place I read said they added the Hercules like 20 years later. So maybe somebody was just a big fan of Greek mythology and thought like, I'm going to stick this there because I'm the boss and I decided to. The Linverm statue was restored in 1997 and I hadn't seen any other descriptions of it being restored. So it must be really hardy. And obviously the comparison there is to make with Crystal Palace dinosaurs, the other thing that's often considered one of the earliest depictions of paleontology. But I'm pretty sure this is made out of a solid piece of something and it doesn't, it's not made out of concrete with rebar that rusts and tears the sculptures apart from the inside out like the Crystal Palace dinosaurs have to deal with. Apparently the woolly rhino skull wasn't identified as a woolly rhino until the 1800s. So for about 300 to 500 years, they considered it to be a dragon skull. This was actually decades after a mummified woolly rhino had already been found. So they had a a mummified version of the woolly rhino, I think in London. And I guess it just took a while for scientists to communicate between those areas and realize that this skull matched with this rhino. So the mummified woolly rhino skull was found decades after the statue was made? The mummified woolly rhino was found in the 1700s at some point. And then they didn't realize until the 1800s that this was a woolly rhino skull that they had based the Linferm on. Oh, I see. And like Sabrina mentioned at the beginning of the show, she is right <laughs> that I ended up in this tangent slash erected Romeo Spurrow because of a discussion on our Discord server about whether dinosaur bones inspired mythical creatures. And I read quite a bit about this. The long story short is that it's impossible to say because all of these origin stories of mythical creatures way predates the printing press and a lot of times writing period. So it predates anybody's knowledge. It's possible that someone found a bone and then wrote a story to explain where that bone came from. But it's also possible that like in this case, the Cloggenfort Linverm legend clearly predated the fossil and then they found the fossil and they fit it into their legend. So it can definitely happen either way. Chicken or egg, it's all dinosaur related. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.